Hi, hey everyone. Welcome to another episode of From the Root to the Fruit. I'm your host, Jay Smith. Uh, our guest today uh, is a tremendous, tremendous lady. She is doing great work in, in the area of social justice for social change, uh, being an ally uh, for people of color and women as well. Also, and not limited to, we're going to get into some some questions and and kind of find out what she's all about and, and where all that stuff came from, who she is, is, is being a wife, a mother, uh, and, and a successful member of society, to be quite candid. Uh, looking, looking forward to this conversation. Uh, one of my favorite people, uh, Lindsay LaFran. Here it is. Uh, so welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome from the root to the fruit. Uh, Lindsay LaFran, how are things? Hello. Good, good. Uh, so so what have you been up to? We're going we're gonna, to, like I said, we're going to roll right into it. Uh, tell everyone about you uh, from the beginning. Like, wh how was your, your childhood? That kind of thing. Wow. That's a big question. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Lindsay. So I am the third out of four kids in my family. I have two older sisters, one younger brother. Um, grew up here in Seattle, lived in Colorado for a while during college and moved back here to Seattle um, in 2009. So I've been back for a while now. Um, but yeah, um, I would say like a lot of sports, a um, lot of activities. I think my parents enjoyed having us be, be all be busy. Um, a lot of time outside, um, playing outside, camping outside, um, just like spending time out there. I think again, because our parents kind of wanted us out of the house. Um, but yeah, a lot of just, I guess, time with other kids, time with my siblings and time outside were sort of like the big pieces of childhood and then playing all the sports. So I'm like back in my day, I feel like an old person. Um, there wasn't like this special specializing in sports like there is now. Um, right. You did everything, right? Like you tried everything and there wasn't as many like, I mean, they had AAU, but it was really like just becoming more, you know, it wasn't at the, at, at the popularity or, or the number, the scale that it is now, yeah. um, you know? So even though I played college basketball, I never even picked up a basketball until I was 12. Um, it just wasn't a sport that I was um, in, right? I have, you nice. know, I've been swimming since I was four, um, and I played soccer since I was a little kid, but I didn't get into basketball till much later because you just didn't specialize. Um, you know, you just played whatever sport was there that season, and then you moved to the next thing. Um, and so I did all kinds of that, um, you know, softball, basketball, volleyball, soccer, swimming, synchronized swimming, tennis, you know, just a variety. Um, and And I mostly just did it to, like, you know, be with my friends because they were. Doing oh yeah, it. for sure. Well, well, tell us a little bit about uh, the synchronized swimming. I've I've seen it obviously on uh, the Olympic level and, and that kind of thing. But how how do you get into that? How is that something that that, that you yeah. delve into? Yeah, I feel like synchro and gymnastics. It's really funny because the only exposure people have is the Olympics. So then when you like show them a video of you doing it, they're like, "Oh, that's garbage," and you're like, "Well, yeah, I'm not an Olympian. Like, you, why don't you send me a picture or video of you doing golf? Like, you would also look bad compared to Tiger Woods. Like, what are you talking right. about?" Um, so obviously, I was a novice. I was not an Olympian. Um, but yeah, our swim club just again had like the, you know, um, different activities, right? So the swim team, the synchronized swim team, the tennis team, and maybe they had something else, pickleball, I think. And I think my parents were just like, hey, we're working. My parents both worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so the pool schedule was, you know, swim practice at eight o'clock and then some other people's had, you know, the different age groups. And then synchro was at 10. And I think tennis started at 11 or 11.30 and then open swim, you know, just for everyone started at one. So basically they would just drop us off there in the morning and you pack a lunch and then you're just there all day. And then when it's open swim, you want to swim with your friends. So then you're there till dinner. So it was kind of like free babysitting, I think a little bit. I love it. <laughs> um, I love it. And, you know, my friends did it and um, I, I've always enjoyed like dressing up, but then also just like being a tomboy. I don't know. That's maybe like a, weird parallel like having both but um I liked it like I loved the costumes I loved like the I can remember like the Knox hair gelatin um being in my hair for days after the the big recital and like I loved the like anticipation of the end of the year show and things like that so 
Um, and the music, like, you, you know, there was always a theme and everyone had a different song from that theme. So yeah, just kind of by default, but I loved it. It was great. That's awesome. Uh, you, you were a college athlete uh, as, as far as basketball. I know you've given tips and tricks to, to our daughter as well. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, kind of kind of tell walk us through what, what a day in the life was like, just an average day being a, a college basketball player. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, you know, experiences vary greatly. Um, I went to a Division II school, um, so a small, small school, um, and uh, I, I made a decision, you know, I sort of skill-wise at the time was on the cusp of going to a Division I school and probably warming the bench, at least for a, a period of time, um, or going to a Division II school, you know, or a, a, or a much smaller Division I school and playing, um, and I, I wanted to play. Um, right. Like you don't go from, you know, playing and like being the, you know, at the time, like the top scorer in your school history to then being like, I'm cool riding the bench. I think, I think. Right. Great. I, full stop. Yeah. I, I just don't want to, yeah. I want to practice all the time and don't do anything. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, my parents were, you know, my dad in this, which you could say was harsh, but I actually appreciate it was like pretty realistic, you know, like we, we went to university of Washington games and we looked and like, yeah, I could have walked on there or I could have, you know, maybe warmed the bench there. Um, but like, I was never going to be six, three, like I was never, and I wasn't quick enough to be a guard on that team. Like my, the skills I had were not a good fit for that team or for a lot of division one teams. Like I actually, my skills were better, um, on a division two team. Like they served the team better. They served myself better. Um, I would have more success. So, you know, and we were also pretty clear about like, I probably am not going to go to the WNBA after this. So I need to pick a school. That's a good school for me, where I feel comfortable, where the education's good, where I'm going to be able to meet people. Um, because if you get injured, you know, you still want to like where you're going. You still want to get a good education. So absolutely, I think, I think that factored into my decision. Day in the life, um, really busy. So I worked, I went to school and I played basketball and, and the playing, you know, if you're not a college athlete, um, it's a full-time job, right? Like in the off season, you're usually doing two a day workouts, you're doing conditioning. Um, so you might work, you might do a weight workout, go to your classes. And then afterwards you have a condition, you know, a cardio conditioning workout. Right. Um, you're usually also, you know, um, potentially depending on the time of year, um, hosting recruits that you're trying to recruit for the following year, you know, so hosting potential folks on campus. Um, and then you're also, um, once you get going in the season, you're traveling. So not only, you know, are you playing, but then you have travel time. And for us, our school's small, so we're not flying anywhere. It's not like you're on a comfortable jet, like you're in a bus and, you know, there's no internet. You're not like banging out papers on the bus. Like you're just sitting on a really uncomfortable bus and driving right. two miles an hour through Nebraska in the snow. Like you're not getting work done. So you got to factor that into your schedule. Um, so I would say it was busy, but I, I loved it. Like I, I like being busy. Um, and I loved my teammates. Um, and we had small classes. So I felt like I was able to stay on top of the work because the professors were really accountable. Like they knew if you weren't in class, so you were like not skipping class. Um, and I liked, I just liked the professors I had and the team was very, um, I mean, those are my friends, you know, I didn't know anyone. I went to school in Colorado. I didn't know a single person. And so those were my, that was my community. Um, and they're going through the same things, right? So it's like a joint struggle. Right, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, struggle or success. So yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, absolutely. I, and, and one of the things that, and especially on this podcast that we like to, to get into is, is kind of the re relationships on the whole from person to person. It could be however that looks. Uh, but have you have had any, were there any challenges for you coming through that and going to a smaller school and, and being a woman in that space and, mm -hmm. and what that looked like, especially being athletic because not for nothing, like coming into the gym. I know when I was in college, like going into the gym, you see uh, a, a, a lady walk, playing with a basketball or whatever, like it's, you may not get picked up for the pickup games and you know what I'm saying? Like what, what, what was that like for you? Yeah, it's interesting. There is a there's a lot of aspects to 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 being away from home and being a, a woman, not necessarily related. Um, what I was thinking wasn't necessarily related to sports. Um, 
you're, you know, I, I think I made a lot of, I don't want to say bad, questionable decisions, um, but I, I learned a lot, right, by doing that because no one's watching you, right? So right, you, right. imagine yourself in a time where your friends are, you know, when you're a kid, your friends are either people you went to school with or played sports with or your, or your parents are friends with their parents. Those are sort of the scenarios of how you get friends. And you're always around each other, so it doesn't take a lot to maintain friendships. Yep. You go somewhere where you don't know anyone um, and no one's watching you now. Your parents aren't watching you. Your friends' parents don't know who you are. You don't have a lot of supervision. You're going to make some questionable decisions. Luckily, none of them were bad enough to like have a long-term effect. But, you know, you, you make decisions and you find out pretty quickly what you're okay with and what you're not. And then right. you have to also live with your decisions for yourself because no one's, no one's watching you, no one's gonna question. And plus you don't have to deal with the accountability or the guilt of being like, oh, my mom's gonna be pissed about this. Cause you know what, she's probably not gonna know about most of the stuff that happened, especially right. back then when there was not social media, right? No one, yes. no one knew. You oh, that, 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 knew. That, that is a saving grace for a lot of stuff. <laughs> so true. So I think, um, you know, I made some questionable decisions but I also found out what I valued about myself what I valued about, uh, you know, my relationships with, you know, with partners, um, what I was willing to do, what I was willing to not sacrifice. Um, and I would say it also made me very aware of how much my um, community, my friend community mattered to me, like how right. much having good friends mattered and what a good friend really was. Um, because, you know, especially in college, you can also just fall into the, like, oh, these are the people who I see every day. And so I'm going to do that. Um, but you know, once you start making some bad decisions, then you find out kind of who's there for you and who's not. So, um, I think it was a good learning aspect in that way. That was not at all related to sports, but more about just transitioning, um, you know, to college being a woman. I think those are, I'm, sh I'm sure men struggle with it too, but you're very much more, um, I don't know. I, I felt like it was just a big challenge for me or a big learning to kind of figure out how do I be myself, but also, you know, like fit in and like have friends and make new friends that if I'm not friends with them because I've known them my whole life. Absolutely. Um, and what does that, what does that mean to me? And, you know, what do, and sometimes, you know, you just value stuff that other people don't necessarily value or it seems foreign to them. Um, and, and like we, we, I tell our kids the, the same thing. It's a trial and error where it used to be where, mm -hmm. where you're, you're getting put in situations and you have to figure a way out of them or to a better, better scenario where they, they feel like in a lot of ways, Oh, well, it should be fine or it should be easy. And, and they're, I don't, they're, hamstrung a little bit by having social media so they feel like they have connections with people that they actually don't have yeah. whereas back like to your point back in the day where when when that was my friend well i saw them every day they came to my house they they ate my my parents food and and likewise and, and we got into misadventures and you you understood oh okay things have to be tested in order yeah. to know what you have so yeah that's a hundred percent, hundred percent. You just, yeah, you, you, you learned by trial and error what you yourself would put up with, but then also, you know, kind of who is going to show up for yep. you and not show up for you. And now let's uh, transition. I know you, you're married, have a daughter of your own. What, what is, what does that look like being a career woman and working mother and, and all these things? Like, uh, obviously I'd, I, my, my wife gets the lion's share of the credit because I, I, wow, <laughs> the, the level of expectation for, for women in a space is completely different than men. A, 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 a husband can go to work, come home, have a beer, go to the room, high five the kids because you're the hero because you came home and then watch football and go to sleep and that's the day. And, and nobody says six words and it's fine. We, meanwhile, mom misses uh, the first 10 minutes of the recital that was just practice. And all of a sudden the sky's falling like chicken little. So. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think you've got to have a solid crew and, and understanding with your partner, first and foremost, of like, what are the expectations and um, what can you agree on together? Right. Uh, the, you know, COVID's even made it harder this year. I would say like people, you know, are asking like, how's it going? And I'm like, uh, I'm just, we're just trying to stay married. Like, how's it going for you? What? Um, so, you know, um, I say that kind of jokingly, but you know, it was a hard year because we had to re, we had to recontract everything. Right. Um, you know, because everything changed and you have to recontract. Well, what is it? You know, what does it look like um, when dinner isn't ready? That wasn't a thing before. It wasn't that impactful. But now it, when we're both exhausted, it's if you don't have a plan, it's impactful and something so small like that. Um, so I think like, we, you know, recontracting and contracting and that happens whether COVID or not, it just was exacerbated by that. But constantly contracting and recontracting with your partner, you've got to do it because you're both evolving. You're both changing every day. Um, and you can take that for granted, you know, um, plus your kids are changing at the same time. So there's all of this change that's constantly happening and stuff that works yesterday doesn't work today and agreements you had are now null and void and you, you, you got to recontract and that's, um, and then people's not only do you have to do the recontracting, but then sometimes even after you do it, people fall into their old habits of like, oh, well, I expect you to do this. Or even sometimes when you, you make a conscious effort to improve, um, the other person is so used to you not doing it that way that they may right. not even give you credit for improving on that particular thing. Um, I know I'm guilty of that, of Casey making a change and me not acknowledging he really made a change, you know, um, and really tried hard and is doing better. Um, and so I think sometimes we're, we're really hard on our partners, um, regardless of the gender roles. The other thing that's interesting is once you've contracted with your partner, then other people have all the opinions too. Oh you know? God. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 uh, not for nothing, an example, I, I liken it to Facebook and I, I don't do it, but if you say, well, I have a headache, all of a sudden, all these people that you know are now the highest level of PhD that has ever been released in the history of mankind for like, like I'm talking about Dr. Quinn, medicine woman level, no one has ever solved more problems than these people. I've, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Experts in all things headaches. So. Yes, their, their house is burning and, <laughs> and they know all the stuff to do. Yeah, so it's just, it's very interesting, um, especially when you take into effect, you know, generational opinions and opinions of, you know, parents, your parents, in-laws, et cetera. Sure. Um, you know, people in the workforce who are maybe of that, uh, of a older generation and what the expectations are. Um, and you, you know, I found like in my current role, the most helpful thing is just being very vulnerable and being like, this does not work for me. Um, and I, and I understand that you might have some notion about this, but like, this is really impacting me, um, or, or, be, or explaining why things are really important to me. So before I took this job, I literally, before I accepted the offer in writing, sent um, email to the manager that said, I'm offline every day from four to eight, because that's the only four hours I get with my daughter while she's awake every day. Right. Nothing, no job will ever be a priority to that. So before I accept this job, are, are we good? Do you agree? Like, is this going to be a problem? Because if it's a problem, I can't take this job. Um, you know, I don't do email on my phone because it's distracting for me. And when I'm with my partner, it annoys him when, when I'm not there. So I don't do that. Is that okay with you? Are, are you going to, is that ever going to be an issue with my job if I'm not on my phone on email and you can't reach me? If it is, this isn't the job for me. So I think being vulnerable and also just setting your boundaries is super important. That can be scary and you can lose opportunities. And I mean, I'm not saying my current company would do that, but like, I, I right. realize it's a very real thing that like you, people could lose opportunities by doing that. So, um, you know, you have to, I guess that's unfortunate in some cases, but I think you have to be comfortable with it and be like, yeah, but I, I know my priorities and my priorities are X, Y, Z. So, you know, in this case, my family. Um, so I can't do that. Um, and you have to have faith that, you know, other doors will open or other opportunities will come that are, you know, that you are able to make your life work. Um, so I think that's, that's a challenge. Um, and I think there's also, 
you know, um, there still seems to be this stigma about being a breadwinner as a female that like, even though like there's a large percentage now in the US that that's the case, um, you know, there's, there's stigmas about that or there's even, you know, comments made, um, you know, to both people, both me and my husband, you know, about that. And um, that also um, has an effect on relationships and how you make decisions. So that's a challenge. Oh, for sure. It, especially with the societal, the societal norms as, as they traditionally are, uh, you, it, it's almost like your, your, your manhood is tested and now you feel some kind of way coming home. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you feel some kind of way coming home and now you're having a different conversation that had actually nothing to do with how you feel about, <laughs> about yeah. what's going on in your house. Yeah. But, and it's, it's just, um, you know, the, the, the emotional tax that goes with explaining to other people, um, which, you know, to some degree, I'm like, I've stopped doing because I'm just like, I don't have time for that. Like, you don't actually need to know it's none of your business, there you, um, go. you know, uh, but like the emotional tax initially of doing that and having to like actually explain to people like, Hmm, if the roles were reversed, would that be a thing? No. So I'll give you an example. Um, <laughs> at some point years ago, I had a comment that was like, so this person's a stay at home parent and they're working part time. And I was like, oh, well, so I, I was thinking about, you know, at some point, if I had the luxury, I would love to work part time and then be, a, you know, three days a week, a stay at home mom. They're like, oh, yeah, that would be great. And I'm like, so it's great for a woman, but it's not great for, for a man to do that. And I'm like, well, well it's, that's not what I'm saying. And I'm like, well, it's actually just exactly what you just said. Precisely what's so, being said. Yeah, exactly <laughs> what you just said. So you're saying that because there's this like, you know, because I'm a woman, I can, it would be totally acceptable for me to work part-time and be a part-time stay-at-home parent. But for a man, that's like, he's contributing less somehow. Like, is, is it's not as valuable for him to be a stay-at-home parent. It's only valuable for a woman. It doesn't, that doesn't jive with me. Um, but I don't, I think it's so ingrained in people over years that they really don't even know um, sometimes that they're, that they have that bias, you know? And, and I feel like in a lot of cases, we're all conditioned to do a thing, right? Like whether it's it, uh, the get up in the morning, whatever, whatever it is, you're just conditioned because everybody else is doing it and, and you never kind of look up to see, wait, does this actually work for me? Is this something that, that I believe in? Does this in, align with my core values at all? Or, or is it even functional for the way that my life is set up? Yeah. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. Let's, let's uh, take a step into kind of the, the society that we're living in right now, a, a environment of, of what I believe to be a level of social change, uh, whether, whether it be uh, from people of color, women, uh, women, women of color, uh, kind of walk me through. I, I affectionately call you, you my super ally. <laughs> just just cuz I I I just dig what you're doing and I dig how you, how how you're getting it done like it's authentic and and it matters and although I I believe in giving people their flowers while they can hear them or they can smell them mm -hmm. uh I I genuinely appreciate you like knowing that the people that are in your circle or in your corner matters to me uh kind of kind of speak to speak to that and and some of the things that you have going on and, and some of the things that, that the reasons that, 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 that were brought on, brought along. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for saying that and letting me smell the flowers. Um, I think it's important distinction that, um, I would, I, I now have learned enough, I would say to not call myself an ally because I, I, you know, I, I didn't make this concept up. I read it somewhere. I now can't remember where because I have mom brain, but, um, right. Where it's like, it, it, it's not your own place to be like, I'm an ally. Right. Or like, it's just like <laughs> right. saying you're funny, you know, like I'm <laughs> funny. And it's like, no, nah, if you have to say you're funny, maybe you're not that funny. Um, I mean, it's not exactly like that, but right. Like an ally is like, you know, that's, that's something you earn from, you know, um, from actually other people actually seeing you act on that and live that and do that. And, the you know um it is something that 
you can't assign to yourself, you know? Right. Um, and it also is not like a point in time, like, oh, now I'm an ally. Um, <laughs> you know? I got, I got my ally merit badge. Check. Yes. Completed the allyship training, done. <laughs> um, you know, it, it has to be a commitment to, to yourself. I think a couple things, um, I would say like accelerated that journey for me. Um, one, having a child. I mean, you, it changes, it ch completely changed who I was. And I think understand, you, you see a lot of yourself when you have a kid, which I wasn't expecting. And I don't mean like, you know, physically, cause my kid also looks exactly like my husband. Um, but you see yourself and you see like, wow, the bad, you see the bad things about yourself and how you parent, you know, and you're like, wow, why am I, why am I like this? Um, and, and you see some of the things just so much more clearly than I ever did before, or there's just not as, you know, the ki the kids will just, they make things very clear to you um, mm -hmm. by how they react because they just, they don't have all this years of trained behavior. They're just reacting in the moment to what's happening. Um, so I think one, her being there has made me not only be reflective of like, hmm, Maybe I, one, don't have all the answers. Two, um, really have some things I need to work on at, right. for myself, about me, to be a better person. Um, and then three, you think about, you know, wh what do you want, how do you want, what things do you want them to value? What things do you want them to know are important? Um, and what kind of a world do you want to leave for them to be in? And that is soup. That is more motivating to me than anything I would do for myself. Sounds maybe weird, but like, you know, I just, that's more motivating for me to like, okay, I want, I want to, you know, teach these things to my daughter that were not taught to me. And I want her to have a world where, you know, things are better. Um, so that's really motivating. And then I think too, like, honestly, being a manager of people, um, and I have a pretty, um, you know, diverse team, not only in just gender and ethnicity, but like backgrounds, experiences, um, parents, not parents, new graduates, people who've been working here for years. Um, and I, I give a lot of credit to them because um, they, you know, share their opinions. And um, there's things that I was just not aware of. Um, that I'm now aware of. And so I think, um, and, and then I also work with, you know, early um, with university talent and this generation of talent also has been um, very vocal, I think, right. and very open. And that is motivating, um, you know, to work with interns and to work with university students who are like, mm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not putting up with this. I don't care if this is the way always things things have always been done. Like, no, it should be different. Um, that's that, really that that phrase right there is is that might be my biggest aggravation. That that's that phrase, but that's the way we always done it. Yeah. That that neither speaks to the efficacy of it, right? Or or the fact that it can't be better, right. <laughs> or even just different. I mean, hopefully right. better, but like, let's also just acknowledge there's like a different way to do things and like different approaches. Um, so yeah, I, I think being with that generation, it, it keeps me open-minded, you know, and, and it keeps me inspired to seeing the possibilities, um, which I'm really, really thankful for. Um, I'm, I really am. Like, I really do think that that's important. And then I think the third thing is just surrounding yourself with a good community who feels comfortable you know, like calling you on your shit, like whether that's about, you know, social justice and change or just like you as a, you know, a person being a better person. Like, I mean, that's one of the reasons, you know, I value our friendship um, and my friendship with your wife, because it's just like, dude, you're being an a-hole right now. Like, yes. what are you talking about? And, and um, that's the differential, like having, having the ability, how you friend and, and how we friend, right? Like I'm, I will be absolutely honest with you without being offensive. Yeah. That that is the the quintessential thing that that people kind of fail to do now because they're talk always talking at each other that mm -hmm. I you can ask me what I think and I will tell you my authentic and my honest opinion vis-a-vis -vis my experiences but that doesn't have to be offensive. Like I don't need you to 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 be black to understand what it would be what my situation has been or, or whatever, but, but having a level of empathy that, Oh, 
well, I, I haven't experienced that. Well, well, tell me, tell me more about that. I mm -hmm. experienced it this way. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just having that um, ability, like you said, to you don't have to be um, a jerk to be direct. You know, you can be direct and kind at the same time. Right. Um, and just, yeah, having empathy that, yes, your experience doesn't, um, isn't everyone's experience. And also that, you know, um, just because you, uh, the, the, the privilege thing is really interesting. That's, that's where I find people really struggle because it's like, well, it, it, this takes away from me. And I'm like, no, it doesn't take away from you. It doesn't take that's... away from you at all. Like, that's not what we're saying. It's not, you're missing the point. So, but I hear that all the time, you know, like, uh, it, you know, candidly, I hear that from white people all the time um, in, in circles that I'm in. And I'm like, this is, it's not a thing that you're, no one's saying that you didn't work hard and no one's saying that growing up poor was not hard. No one is right. saying that at all. That's not the point. Um, uh, you know, it just wasn't made harder by other factors. Um, right. and so or, or, or able, even now, walk up, walking into a, if, if you and I walk into a store, how I walk into the store is completely separate and different than <laughs> how you would walk into the store. Like, I, it's just how I it thought, is. I thought about it the other day. This is just a random example, but I was thinking, and then I was like, Jolie, get back here. So we went, we did a neighborhood walk. We were looking at Christmas lights. Oh yeah. And, and she walked, my daughter walked up um, onto, you know, she's in the front yard. She wasn't like deep in their yard or like near their house, but she was in their yard. She was, she was off the sidewalk mm -hmm. and she was touch, she was touching the lights. And I was thinking how cute she looked and oh my gosh. And then I was like, wow, what a privileged thing to do to assume that this was okay to be on someone else's property, to have her touching these lights. And, and, and also I was not at all worried about it. I wasn't thinking, oh my gosh, someone's going to come out and be pissed at us. Like I, I, I literally, I didn't initially think about it. And then I was like, mm -hmm. oh my, wow. Okay. Come back off here. And she wasn't doing anything offensive. Right. It, it was, not, yeah. You know, it wasn't the point. <laughs> Um, so that was just a one, like, that was just a random thing that hit me the other day. And I'm like, it's the simplest thing. We're doing the simplest thing. And we're so, we don't even realize how easy this is for us yeah. to do. So what, what are the, what are the next steps? What are the, uh, obviously you, you have a, a very diverse team that you're working on. Uh, you're having those conversations in the spaces that you're in. Uh, I, I've always said that uh, if you're somebody incredible, the first thing you do is create more. <laughs> the first thing you do is not be by yourself and create more. Uh, are there any steps to kind of, obviously, you, you, you can only control what you can control, but the do you feel like having those conversations or, or allowing other people to to – just take a look at it. it, it, it it's mm -hmm. not wholesale changes, but just take a look at, at the information being presented. Yeah. Some people, yes, yeah, some people know, you it's know, um, and you gotta, I think you, I don't know, I'm a play to your strengths person. And so I think you, you, you try, but then if someone is completely never going to listen to your perspective, regardless, like I'm actually not gonna invest my time there. Like that's the definition of insanity. It's just like doing something over and over and over and getting, trying to get a different result. It's not gonna work. So where can you influence? Like where can you make change, you know? And part of that is, you know, my job. Like we're, we're I'm in hiring, so I hire people. So if I can hire people, if I can influence the people who are making hiring decisions, if I can get students that maybe wouldn't initially have an opportunity, to have an opportunity or to even think about that opportunity. There we go. That's, that's huge. I mean, that's one of the reasons I took the job I have now. The second thing is your, your kids. I know that seems like very far fetched and like very like, ah, the generation of the future. But you know, if they, if they grow up, you know, um, and sort of, you know, you don't know, like, she, she, I hope that Jolie doesn't have to unlearn a bunch of bad, you know, I'm not saying that I learned a bunch of bad habits, but you know what I'm saying? Like, right. I have to unlearn things. I have to consciously unlearn things. And I'll, I'll give you one example that's not related to um, social change. Right. 
I grew up in a very vocal family and there was yelling. There was yelling. And I didn't realize that literally until I was married and my husband, we got in an argument about something and he was like, you, why are you shouting at me? And I was like, well, we're fighting. And he was like, you, you don't have to shout at me though. Like you can just argue in a regular level voice. And I literally was like, oh, I can. Oh my God, I can. I, this is this possible. This can happen. This can happen. <laughs> I had to work extremely hard for years to not shout when I was mad. Literally, it took me years to unlearn it. So think about something that small, but a big concept about who you thought you were and why you think you got opportunities and then try to unlearn that. I don't ever want my daughter to be in that position. I don't want her to have to work so hard to unlearn stuff. Um, you know, I want her to be able to get it. I don't want to say get it right, but you know, I want to, I want to challenge her to be open-minded and to be kind. Um, and to know, um, to know some of these, you know, I'll say truths that I didn't, you know, didn't know previously. So I think, you know, if you can take action in your, your job or in a volunteer sense or to make actual change or to donate however you want to do that piece of it, like actual action in your daily life, if you can try to raise your children that way, um, and then you influence your own circle, right? You influence yep. your community for those who are receptive. Again, like I, I was trying to really go for like some really hard, and then after a while I was like, this is actually not productive for anyone. Like I'm actually, I could be influencing people who would are open-minded about it. Um, and that would be a better use of time and impact. For sure, for sure. Well, I, I, I've enjoyed this conversation. And I look forward to, to talking to you again. Um, this has been another episode of From the Root to the Fruit. I've been Jay Smith. Uh, Lindsay LaFran, thank you so much uh, for your time and the opportunity to talk to you about this stuff. Uh, please like and subscribe. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time.